thing. Uh, but uh, in normal times, it isn't the most riveting of topics, but obviously these aren't normal times. And at the moment, it's about the most important subject that there is. We meet uh, in the middle of an extraordinary economic crisis. It's been said that this is a global crisis that needs global solutions. And uh, just two weeks from now, the G20 summit will be in London, which may be the most concerted effort yet to find this elusive global solution to, to the world economic crisis. So what should we be hoping for? This afternoon's panel brings together participants from four continents to discuss this question. R Robert Zelik is president of the World Bank, based in Washington, D.C. Celso Amorim is uh, foreign minister of Brazil. Kamalesh Sharma is secretary general of the Commonwealth, and before that, a distinguished Indian diplomat who is variously his country's ambassador to the UN and the United Kingdom. And Mark Malik brown is Britain's Minister for Asia, Africa and the UN and was Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations under Kofi Annan. Robert Zellick, I, I was thinking about this, this mantra that this is an international crisis and must be solved internationally. First of all, I wondered, do you think that that's correct? And, and how are we doing in terms of finding international cooperation that can get us out of this problem? Well, I tend to say it's a global crisis because I don't want to just emphasize the national aspect of it. Um, and it will require a global solution, um, as we talked about this morning. How we're doing, um, I think, um, relative to what one might have expected, the fact you've got some good stimulus plans and people are trying to pull together on additional resources for the IMF and some of the other issues, some of the regional development banks, um, that there has been a constructive response. But as we discussed this morning, the depth of this is going to be beyond what anybody can predict. So I think that there's going to be an ongoing need for the G20 and other groups to, to monitor and make mid-course corrections. I think on the G20, the key point I, I'd make is that no one group is going to do it all. I think the mistake is trying to assume that there's one body, G7, G20, G whatever. Um, I think one needs to look at that group in a way as a, as a form of a steering group and how it interacts with other groups, World Bank, WTO, IMF, other regional organizations, and that adds a complexity uh, to the system. But I think as long as we're in an environment where you've got nation states, some regional organizations, some international organizations, that's the reality we're going to have to deal with this problem. Okay. Mr. Amory, the, the reporting in, in uh, the weeks running up to the G20, a lot of it's focused on a kind of uh, European-U.S. disagreement over should it be about fiscal stimulus, should it be about regulatory reform, but I suppose the whole point of the G20 is that it wasn't just the, the old G7, that it brought in emerging powers like Brazil. So viewed from, from Brazil, what, what matters most about this meeting we're about to have? Well, what matters most is that the leaders are able to take decisions and then after that, that these decisions are carried out by bureaucrats and negotiators because one of the important decisions that were taken in the meeting of Washington, for instance, was to conclude the Doha round until December and uh, in spite of the call by the leaders, the negotiators were, myself included, by the way, uh, were unable to do that. So I think this is certainly an important aspect. Uh, if I would single uh, out one aspect of which is crucial for developing countries, I would say it's the lack of credit. And I know that there is a, a lot of interest uh, uh, in the World Bank, and if there would be one fraction or maybe a portion of one fraction of what's being given to bail out failed banks in the rich world to improve credit for trade among developing countries or developing countries to developed countries, that would be a great help that we would like to see. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Sharma, from an Indian and Commonwealth perspective, is this an important meeting and, and what, what would you like to see come out of it? You would like to think that the G20 doesn't think itself or off itself as an expanded magic circle of the G7 or G8. We'd like to think it regards itself as less a magic circle than a catchment basin which collects the views of the G127 that are out of it. Mm. And I think uh, we, we were encouraged by the communique from Washington which said that we are going to try and arrest the drift towards nationalism and protectionism because trade is absolutely crucial to growth and economic expansion. And we were also encouraged by many of the principles that were mentioned. But above all, the idea that we are in an era of new multilateralism now. The old multilateralism was an option. The new one is an imperative. Mm. 
because all your solutions are collective. All your approaches have to be collective as well. And I think it is the role of the G20 to be more like the T20 or the Trustees 20, which collects the views which are applicable, which will be seen globally as responding to the anxiety which is in their minds as well. Okay. Lord Malik Brown, I'm Britain's hosting this meeting. I gather you've been doing a fair amount of travelling on behalf of the Prime Minister, gathering views from countries that will be there. What, what are you hearing and what do you think we can realistically expect out of London? Well, the first thing difference between the G8 and G20 is a lot more air miles <laughs> for the political envoy. Um, but it's fascinating because, you know, a couple of things here are happening. And the first is that, you know, whereas the conversation amongst the old developed economies is very much about stimulus and regulation, uh, it is uh, when you bring in the rest of the G20, Brazil and others and India, you, you, you start to get much more emphasis on the desperate need for a trade agreement to be completed quickly because they're all faced with these collapsing export markets. Secondly, a lot of focus on the reform of the IMF and the World Bank, driven by the fact that developing countries are really anxious to see large volumes of public finance substitute for the loss of private finance and the loss of export earnings. And you know, the third thing, of course, predictably, and I think quite correctly, is that the poorest countries who back in November thought this was somebody else's crisis uh, because it was a banking sector crisis and they had very small, thin, conservatively managed financial sectors, now find that now that it's an exports and trade and commodity price crisis, it's hitting them really hard. So uh, they're very anxious to see special arrangements to meet the needs of African countries and other poor countries. But just a concluding thought, what comes across most strongly, despite different emphases of agenda, is the sense of interdependence, the feeling when you go to China that the loss of the American consumer has hit China or Japan hard, the feeling when you go to Africa similarly that it's the loss of those overseas export markets, the worry about the value of the dollar vis-a-vis -vis other currencies for countries with large dollar holdings. There is a real sense that this is an interdependent problem and that you need a global solution because no part of the global economy can recover unless the whole global economy recovers. Mm. So we, well, we heard uh, an emphasis from you that, that you're hearing a lot about trade, but Mr. Zellick, you, your own institution, the World Bank, produced this report, I think it was last week, showing that despite the uh, sort of hand-on-heart statements at the last G20 meeting that were all in favour of completing the Doha round and against protectionism, since then, 17 of the 20 countries have actually introduced protectionist measures. So should we even believe what we hear out of the London meeting? There does seem a tension between what leaders say to each other when they meet internationally and the political pressures they're under at home. Well, exactly. But I, I, I mean, uh, I think Celso put his finger on the biggest one. It was to get the Doha run done, and they obviously didn't. Um, but I think that doesn't mean that the meetings are a sham because... Uh, one of the reasons we produced that study, and the WTO has produced others, was to draw public attention to these steps. At the same time, I think we noted there were some 47 actions. People can debate whether they are appropriate ones or not, because a lot of them don't violate any WTO rules. But I think it's important to have them out in the public domain, and in some cases use a name and shame process to draw attention to those that will be of a protectionist nature. As, as I mentioned this morning, and I talked with Celso, I think there's a particular obligation for developed countries. Uh, it's going to be very hard for developing countries to resist protectionist impulses if developed countries don't. So I think in that sense, uh, statements that commit themselves to a standstill and ask the WTO or the World Bank and others to report on this are useful. But of course, uh, are, you know, are we in a system where there's total enforcement? No. Uh, but that's because we're in a nation-state system and the international bodies can do the best they can to stitch these together. Mm. Mr. Amarin, perhaps you could give us a sense of the, the political pressures you're under as a politician in Brazil when people look at this economic crisis. How easy is it for your government to say, well, actually, we're not going to go the protectionist route. You've had protectionist legislation placed before the president. And he refused it. Indeed. Yes, uh, well, it will be more and more difficult as time goes by because, of course, protectionism is not only a poison, as many people say, but it's also a contagious disease. 
and it, it, it spreads out very quickly. Uh, I, will, I would say one thing about this question of protectionism. It's, its exhortations are fine, and of course, they are worth what they are worth. They are exhortations. The only way really to avoid protectionism is, is, is if you go for, forward. I know it's a worn out uh, metaphor, but it's, you know, it's like a bicycle in trade. You either move forward or you fall down. Mm. That's why the dough around is so important. But more and more, people who are defending the dough around are being seen as idealistic people without touch with reality. And we have this paradox now that it's more difficult, because indeed it is difficult in a, in a, term, in a moment like this, uh, but it's more also more necessary. So that's the big challenge I find in relation to trade. But trade is, of course, not the only matter. I mentioned credit, which is very fundamental for mm. developing countries. I mean, Mr. Sharma, you represent an unusual international organization in that it, it has some of the, you know, the world's leading industrialized nations and also some of the world's poorest countries. As you try to establish a sort of common commonwealth interest, is it there to be found in this crisis? Oh, yes, there is one. I think we have a statement on that question. Um, we have said that uh, uh, there are two principles in the world which is upon us which must be observed. The first one is that of inclusivity. Whatever you do must be inclusive, otherwise it's not sustainable. And the other one is of principles, which is that if you start from the right principles, you're not prejudging the results and the outcomes, but you will come to the right ones. But these principles must be observed, and these are fairness, uh, representativeness, legitimacy, um, transparency, accountability, effectiveness. Now, these words may look like, you know, uh, motherhood and apple pie. Idealistic uh, pronouncements. Mm -hmm. About 53 heads of states have subscribed to them and mentioned them in this document <laughs> that the time has come to speak about international relations <coughs> in a way in which the ownership is seen to be total ownership. Right. Okay, Lord Malik Brown, perhaps the last question for you before I, I consult the audience. Um, one of the other debates that it seems to me is kind of emerging in, uh, in the run-up to the G20 is between those who see this as an immediate kind of economic crisis mm. which needs urgent policy responses and those who are interested in using it for institutional reform. Now, everybody's interested in a bit of both, but there seems to be, if I can mm. perhaps caricature a little bit, the Europeans, the home of institutional navel-gazing, we're very keen to talk about institutions. The Americans keener on a sort of immediate economic shock to the system. Where do you think the balance should be struck? Well, you know, I'm going to disappoint you by saying both, uh, the worst answer <laughs> yeah. for this, to that kind of question, but it really is both, because you know, clearly you need some short-term recovery, fiscal stimulus measures to make up for the lost, as much of the lost demand in the world economy as you can uh, over the next couple of years. But looking beyond that, you will not restore confidence to the financial sector or to consumers or indeed be protected against future crises unless you deal with these issue, global regulatory issues. I mean, you need to make sure that there's no jurisdiction or no part of the financial sector, whatever its name, that can again pose systemic threats through not being properly regulated. Now, you know, this is easier said than done because this crisis did not start in an under-regulated segment. It started in plain old vanilla uh, American consumer banking and mortgage lending, but the fact is going forward, if we have more regulated markets in the US and Europe, but don't in some parts of the world, it will drive financial sector activity into those unregulated places. So we need both, but I think the, most, the biggest priority is recovery now. Okay. Gideon, can I just come Please do, yeah. yeah. I think one of the other challenges for a group like the G20 is in addition to having pronouncements and directions and reviews that a certain legitimacy and confidence has to come from actions and results. And one reason um, we at the bank group have tried to put together a new trade liquidity facility goes exactly to what uh, Celso mentioned. It was very interesting. What we could see uh, early on was that you had a huge drop in trade, biggest drop in 80 years, um, much of it driven by demand. But in many countries, it's because you can't get credit. The market is dried up. Now, trade credit is normally not a risky credit. It's normally about 180, 270 days. We start out by expanding a guarantee program 
uh, which we developed with about 160 developing country institutions in some 60 countries. But we saw the pickup wasn't there. And what we realized was there was a, it was a problem of lack of money. And so we're actually bringing to our board on March 31, so in right in advance of this, something that would allow us to get some money from governments, our money, but then leverage it with commercial bank funding. So we're working with a number of large commercial banks. So about every $4 we put in, they'll put in 6 so as to start maybe, you know, in April with maybe $20 billion, up to $30, 40 $50 billion of trade liquidity over the next couple of years. I, I think as the leaders consider these problems, what they also have to do is think of the right mix of things that can show you're actually addressing a problem. Otherwise, it all becomes like hot air. Okay. Um, questions from the floor? Is there any, any points or questions that anybody wants to make? Yeah, Dan Dresner in the front row, yeah. Have we got a microphone for him? Here it comes. Thank you. I have a question about the push towards greater regulation, and there seems to be a paradox here. On the one hand, clearly part of the reason we're in this crisis now is that there were a whole variety of financial institutions that were too big to fail. And because they were too big to fail, they've had to be bailed out. In my experience, though, if you try to regulate a sector, it frequently creates a cartel that actually makes it much more tough, much more difficult for new entrants to enter and therefore guarantees that you're going to have a lot of very big firms. How do you avoid this paradox? Well, look, I, I think the, you know, the world is full of examples of trying to protect against the last crisis and then the way you do that, so sternly looking over your shoulder, you're, you don't, you know, the next one hits you. And, and I think, frankly, for that reason, uh, we've got to move into this area of regulation with some prudence and care. And we must not flip from the now much criticized light regulatory touch to, you know, something which is just so heavy handed uh, that in indeed it has those effects you describe. And that's why I think the kind of formula that we're talking about, which is strong principles globally adopted of regulation, but which are applied by national regulators who understand local conditions. And then that you use the Financial Stability Forum and the IMF and BAL in some kind of combination to make sure that national regulators are you know, dealing with this in a relatively uniform way is the way to go rather than some sort of global super regulator who indeed I think could have that unintended effect. Okay. Um, here, just, just in the front row over here, a uh, woman in the black. Uh, could you just wait for the mic and also tell us who you are? That would be great. Barbara Thomas, Judge. I used to be an SEC commissioner, although now I do nuclear. Just one comment about um, overregulation. Remember Sarbanes Oxley. Sarbanes Oxley was supposed to be the answer to the problem that we had with Enron. And I think everybody. Uh, re related to Sarbanes-Oxley thinks that it was overkill rather than over-regulation. So it's just, Lord Malik Brown, I think you're right. We need to find a solution that's not to the last war. Yeah, but, and again, though, it is why you need a global approach because Sarbanes-Oxley, do I dare say this, was a huge windfall for London. Um, and so, you know, you've got to make sure in future that you have universality of approaches so that you don't drive the financial sector into, you know, places where there is less regulation in ways which pile up problems for later. But so that mean, light and sensible but universal. Won't that mean no more windfalls for London then? It, it will. But I think that's the price of it, that you cannot in future use regulatory systems to create you know, unfair advantages. Your advantages have to come from a broader set of, if you like, level playing field factors. But last point on this before we move on, but c can you do that just based on everybody agreeing to principles or do you need something that's actually legally enforceable internationally? Well, there were always people le legally enforcing uh, the obligations mm. of developing countries. <coughs> what never happened was <laughs> someone trying to legally enforce principles on rich countries. And uh, coming back to your first question, you ju just said whether it was national or international. Mm. I think this is a nationally generated crisis with international repercussions. And most countries that have very well and sound uh, financial systems are suffering uh, from the consequence. So these questions that are being discussed maybe between experts 
uh, of rich countries, but they are of interest to everybody else. And then I think there is a, I think the G20, if you allow me, because this Please is an important point related to what uh, 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 Ambassador Sharma said. Uh, uh, of course, the G20, in relation to what existed before, is a step forward in terms of world governance. I don't know how it will be institutionalized and so on, and how it will reflect on the voting structure of the IMF or the World Bank. But it is, it is a progress in terms of seeing. But even there, you see the mindset is still limited. For instance, the G20 has just been amplified to include Spain and uh, Netherlands. We have nothing against uh, the countries. On the contrary, in the case of Spain, we even support it explicitly. But why not Egypt? Why not other developing countries being part there? And in, the, in this Basel committee that oversees the banking, uh, it was some expansion, but there's no African country. So the mindset is still an old mindset. And if you don't correct the mindset, we'll continue dealing with the problems of today and tomorrow with the mindset of yesterday. Mm. Robert Zellick, could I just ask you uh, what about this regulation question, how far are we, in, if we're going to deal effectively with the issues thrown up by this crisis, going to have to accept that there's going to be some rollback of, of national sovereignty over issues like regulation? It must be. Uh, it's obviously an issue that's out there, but you're an international civil servant now, but you know, you've been an American diplomat. You, you know how tough that would be to sell in America. I don't think it's only the case in the United States. I think if you uh, look at Dolores Ayer's report, you see that in the European Union, which you've had shared sovereignty developed over 40 years, there's still some very strong sensitivities about national supervisory authorities. Um, I think within many countries, I mean, the U.S. Has, has a challenge in that it's got, even within one national system, it's got regulatory authorities piled upon regulatory authorities that are left from historical uh, accidents of, uh, of evolution. So I, I frankly think what the what you're going to see here is that uh, different national authorities will try to address uh, the same issues. And the question is, how can they be interconnected together? And this is where the Financial Stability Forum, I think, could play an additional role. And I think it's the type of uh, leadership that Mario Draghi, the chair of it, has already started to play. Now, as Celso said, uh, the Financial Stability Forum had developed some pretty good rules, but it had been a smaller group. It didn't include developing countries. So the first step is to start to expand that. Um, but what, what I would caution here is, in part because of the politics of this, there's, there's a view that says, you know, let's get those bastards and we'll regulate them and so on and so forth and they'll never do that again. It's just, it's some of these questions, it's not quite so simple. Uh, and, and one has to remember that some of the institutions that got in trouble were extremely regulated institutions, some weren't regulated institutions. And so, um, you know, the, the second and third order effects of these problems bear close consideration. And I think what you'll find is that, just as we've talked about in other contexts, these start to become very sensitive to national uh, considerations and authority. So I, I, I wouldn't set out the goal that you're going to have a global financial regulator because you won't. But what you could have and what you need to have is some greater interaction among some of these national regulators. And this is where people come to terms like principles. They start to say about general approaches. And uh, I think that would be a reasonable aspiration to have come out of this. Okay, great. I've had my back rudely to this side of the room. So, uh, gentlemen, just here. Hi, uh, Jerry Halton. I'm head of uh, Polytechnic Institute of New York University, an engineering and technology school. The, uh, in some ways, what the conversation up now has been about putting the uh, cards back into the house of cards. But there's something I think missing, or going to be missing, I want to ask the panel, and that is, uh, we've been priming American consumptive demand, consumption demand, with uh, lending from China. Uh, that's probably ended. Uh, where are the jobs and the uh, consumer demand going to come from that basically drive this new multilateral uh, restructuring? And I think that's the bigger question that's unanswered yet about the future of the world economy. Who wants a crack at that? <laughs> okay, so let's ask well, I'm, I'm, I'm not the best person to, to describe who will uh, replace China. Certainly not Brazil, I'll be able to, to tell you. Although we are, all, we are the fifth lender, our fifth taker of the U.S. bonds. Uh, well, I think a lot has to come uh, from inside the countries. And they should use all the, all the means available uh, to them and not shy 
uh, before taking some actions. Uh, I think I'm speaking very honestly here and very frankly. I think, for instance, in the case of some countries, less in Europe and I think more in the United States, there is a, some kind of, we call it a, a, a chalk circle uh, uh, from which people cannot go. And that has to do, for instance, with nationalization of banks, which, have to be, which might be a necessary thing if you want really to, 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 to correct uh, uh, and to restore credibility to the system. When I'm saying nationalization, of course, I'm not necessarily saying socialism. You can give back the banks, as Sweden did some years ago. But I think uh, uh, one of the, 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 the limitations I see in the measures taken uh, uh, is so far is that there is always an effort to resolve through the market some of the problems that the market them itself failed to resolve. Mm. Uh, so this is one basic aspect. But uh, how also are you going to put money in the economy? I think there are several ways, of course, uh, but uh, certainly easing the conditions for credit, not only internal, but uh, for uh, international trade and developing countries, because developing countries also nowadays buy a lot from the rich countries, would uh, certainly help. I, I just say to Jerry's point, I mean, I, I think the most dangerous idea still alive out there is that the world is going to somehow expect the American consumer to once more ride to the rescue and save the world economy by borrowing and spending. And that, you know, if, if that idea is left out there and not addressed by the rest of the world, it is un undoubtedly going to lead to protectionism in America. I mean, that, that's uh, because why absolutely shouldn't it? Uh, and in that sense, I think part of the messaging which has not gotten through so clearly because we're also seized with the moment and the immediate is that within the recovery has to be an absolute understanding that global imbalances yeah. are in the medium term going to be reduced. And the good news, Jerry, from my travels is, you know, in Asia, that is really understood. In China, there is a very open discussion about the fact that the Chinese save 50% of GDP and the US has been saving zero. And the 50% of GDP is two-thirds government, one-third Chinese citizens. The two-thirds government, government plan to spend a lot more on health, education, and social safety nets. By doing that, not only will it bring its own savings rate down, but it will release consumer savings, which are driven by kind of saving for the rainy day when the kid needs to go to college or somebody needs an operation. So, you know, I think the Chinese, and, and not just China, but other countries in Asia as well, understand this. And I think we've got to have that discussion because otherwise it's not a credible, sustainable solution. Okay. There seem to be lots of people waving at me. Uh, just the, somebody's already preemptively got the microphone, so would you like to introduce yourself? And, uh... Thank you, Jean-Pierre Lehmann, Avion Group at IMD. Um, I want to pick up on something that Celso Amarim said, and um, in fact, last time we saw each other, I was mentioning this book, which I think we've both read, uh, Power and Plenty, and I think a lot of people in the room have probably read it, if not, they should. And when you get to the chapter in the 1930s, it's absolutely fascinating, because the League of Nations convened a whole bunch of meetings on trade and protectionism, and when you read the declarations, you change a word here, you change a word there, and it's eerily sort of similar to the language you're getting out of the G7s, the G8s, and now the G20. So or words, 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 as you put it out. So this leads me to two questions. One is, uh, would it not be better for the G20 in London not to have any declaration at all? Uh, and, you know, simply to work on, say, you know, we will get back to you on the actions we've think... taken. Sorry, and particularly, uh, we heard um, Barroso yesterday saying that the EU would insist uh, once again on the completion of the Doha Round. I mean, does anybody in this room believe that the Doha Round will be completed this millennium? And is there not a serious credibility risk that by repeating this all the time uh, and you know, nothing happens, that it's delegitimizing uh, the whole process? And I think this picks up on, on what you said. So one, no declaration. Two, certainly not anything about Doha until it's actually completed. Colonel Sharma is a veteran of all well, these I, I can give very direct answers to those questions. I think if there's no declaration, it'll look like a cartel. Yes, there'll be conspiracy it'll look, theories. It'll, it'll, it'll look like an inside talk, primarily of interest to themselves. So I think it'll be a very deleterious outcome. Secondly, if you don't refer to Doha, 
what you're saying is you don't believe in a multilateral rule-based system. How can that be? Even if a thing doesn't happen, G20 did say that at the end of last year, we should have had a ministerial, we should have killed this problem. That it didn't happen doesn't mean you don't talk about it. But what happens to all the people whose very trading livelihood depends not upon the fact that they're strong traders, they're weak traders in the system, but it depends upon a rule-based system. And Doha represents that. But there is a credibility problem, isn't there? I mean, if, if, you, if every year you meet and say, we're going to complete the Doha round, and you yeah. never do, I mean, at a certain point, people just laugh. Well, I mean, you can, you can say that we believe in the system, therefore this is the system which must prevail, mm. and so on. But if you say, we shouldn't have a Doha round at all, it means, A, you d you're denying this, and secondly, you're not even answering the question that originally it was a development round. <coughs> We are still talking about the nexus between development and trade. We seem to have forgotten it. So I think it will be an abnegation, really, of two ideals. Okay, anybody else? Any views on this? Yeah, I, I want to take the question in a slightly different direction. And I would use your League of Nations example as um, a caution that multilateralism alone isn't enough. Uh, I often point to the League of Nations as when people say, look, everybody's got to have an equal voice and everybody's got to be at the table. <laughs> Fine, that happened with the League of Nations, and what did it do? So what you've seen over the years is people come up with different structures. They have their flaws. And he, they, what, Celso and I spent a lot of hours in what's called the green room in the WTO. In the WTO, all countries have a voice. Everybody has to come together. Do you think you're going to get 155 countries all in the same room at one point, or economies to be precise? No, you're not. So you're going to have to come up with models where you get smaller numbers pushing things forward. And the real answer to the Doha round and the real answer to the G20 is that some of the leading countries, it used to be in the developed world, now it's got to be developed and developing world, have to take some larger risk and step to make the systemic benefit works. So if you read Charles Kindleberger about the Great Depression and looking at this area, that's one of his conclusions. Now the harder thing now is it's not just one country. It can't just be the United States. It's got to be a group of countries. And any time you have collective action, that becomes a little bit more tricky. But I suspect Celso and I from a developed and a developing country could agree. There's a deal on the table in Doha. Now is it a perfect deal? No. Would it be a big advance? I think so. Uh, but it's a question of political will about whether people are willing to drive that deal forward in the face of what are increasing protectionist sentiments. So that's the lesson of the League of Nations is, is that countries have to exercise political will. Mr. Sharma, is, is your emphasis on representativeness and fairness in danger of just leading us to a new League of Nations where nothing gets well, done? Well, to begin with, I, uh, I must say that the problem with the League of Nations was that everyone wasn't on the table. That's why it failed. The people who should have been there weren't there. That's why it failed. Yes. Not because everyone was there. The second point is that we are not saying everyone should be physically present. But you can't have a world divided into rule makers and rule takers. Not anymore. Everyone's concerns have to be on the table and fairly represented. This is what we've been saying about the G20. The G20 must enable an interactive culture which universalizes the concern which they are talking about. Not that they embrace everyone in the world. That will be a very large conference. Yeah, Mark, you, you've had to face this trade-off between effectiveness and fairness all your career at the UN. Yeah, yeah. How do you strike it now? Well, look, I, I, I mean, I, I think that the G20 has no formal status. It is a clearinghouse. It's a facilitator. The fact is most decisions it makes, any decision it makes, needs to go back either to national decision-making or more normally to a UN or a World Bank board or some other place to get turned into a formal agreement. And that's key because we've got to not allow it to seem as though it's another exclusive club. Uh, it's got to be seen for what it is, as Bob described, a place to arrive at some ideas to which you go to the broader global community uh, to get endorsement and perhaps uh, modification. But if I could just also say on that very splendidly clever and provocative point, I mean, obviously a great picture would be worth a lot of text if you actually could get 20-plus world leaders looking confident about the future. Um, and they're not just looking as though they'd had a good lunch. It would be fantastic. But the key to confidence is actually going to be a communique, which is not just empty words, but as Bob said earlier, is full of very specific things around these 
key points of stimulus, regulation, reform of the institutions, something for the poor, and something on trade. And on trade, it's not that complicated. It is India and the United States, to be a bit more explicit, I think, about the point, which in the rest of, eyes of the rest of the world could offer the breakthrough once their political processes allow, which could get us to the completion of a round. On the trade issue, so, uh, I think... Uh, uh, you are quite right. We can, we can be ridiculous and growingly ridiculous if we continue saying that we, continue, we want to uh, close the round and it just doesn't happen. But also there is an educational work to be developed, and I, specifically in certain countries, because, for instance, when I hear the discussion in the United States, to give an example, about uh, uh, the Doha round, uh, it's always confused with the discussion, for instance, with the, the free trade agreements. The Doha round is not about... Uh, uh, eliminating all the tariffs and making complete free trade. It's nothing like that. It's just that minimum that keeps the multilateral trading system going and addressing most of all, and, you know, with some give and take because it's necessary, but Bob Zelik and I myself know that very well, basically eliminating or at least reducing the biggest distortions that exist to world trade and which affect not only Brazil, France, India, or the United States, but affect Mali, Chad, uh, 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 Burkina Faso, the countries that are not uh, probably in this room. Okay. Well, in my, my own effort to combine efficiency and fairness, I'll now take three questions from each side of the room. Uh, there's a gentleman over there. Just... Uh, thank you. I'm Atul Kaushik from Cuts International. Uh, I want to ask this uh, question uh, with the assumption that we're not going to have the Doha round decided on the 2nd of April, but what we are hearing is that there's going to be some decision or at least some declaration of commitment on standstills. Now the question that comes is that can you have a kind of commitment from the political leaders on this standstill that still keeps the Doha round alive from the, develop alive from the development perspective, from the, kind of, from the perspective of the kind of countries that uh, uh, Minister Amore mentioned, uh, the cotton countries for example, and one way of doing it is that instead of harping only on standstill on tariffs, can we have a standstill on the kind of agreement that already has been achieved in July last year and has been preserved as per the statements made in the WTO by all nations who participated in that and can be implemented as an early harvest, whatever legal pundits, uh, uh, okay. howsoever legal pundits can make it, so that the world outside understands that we are not 15th of November, we are 2nd of April, we have made a commitment, we have actually implemented it, and now we are moving towards a Doha development round conclusion eventually. Okay, very good. I'll hold that thought and we'll take a, a question from here. Thank you. It's also on Sorry, trade. could you just uh, say yeah. here? Uh, Jean Pisani from uh, Bruegel Think Tank here in Brussels. It's also on trade. It seems to me we're discussing about uh, whether or not uh, we can improve the, the rule of the game. But what's happening now is that you can do a lot of harm while abiding by the rules. Uh, just uh, look at what's happening with, with banks. Basically, uh, you can attach string to, to public support to banks that, has your, that banks have to lend at home. Implicitly, they don't lend cross-border. Uh, you can do the same with, with companies that increasingly uh, in the manufacturing sector will depend on uh, public support. And you can also bias your stimulus in the direction of domestic industry. So uh, I think it would be uh, urgent to address those I mentioned that uh, are perfectly compatible with the rule of the game, uh, but are, are nevertheless uh, doing a lot of harm. And that would require being, being specific and having some kind of code of conduct uh, rather than, than planning for the next round. Okay. And over here, that's the gentleman there. The microphone is approaching. My name is John Kornblum. I live in Berlin. I would just like to ask a, so almost a factual question, but it seems to me something that might interest a lot of us. You talked about regulation, about what to do with the financial markets. Can you look now... 9, 12, 18 months ahead to tell us what the financial markets are going to be. <laughs> Is that an investment uh, tip? Uh, advice? Um, I don't mean that. I mean, it was not two years ago that everyone told us 
that it was all going to be computerized, done on Facebook or wherever. Uh, we didn't need the IMF anymore. Probably we didn't need the World Bank anymore because the capital was all going to be gotten on the capital markets. It was going to be 200 CFOs around the room who were moving money around all the time. In other words, the, the flat earth vision of the financial markets just two years ago was that there wasn't anything more to regulate. And is the genie out of the bottle? Can you come up, you or, I mean, the people who are doing it, can one come up with structures and regulations which will, in fact, uh, restore or uh, add a little bit of order to a market which seemed to have spun out of uh, institutional control? Okay, thanks. Well, we had two trade questions there and uh, one finance and financial regulation question. I don't know who I should pick on, if anybody particularly wants to take on. Uh, Mr. Amarillo. On the trade questions. Yeah. I will pass on the financial questions. <laughs> yeah. On the trade questions... Uh, first of all, in, the, in relation to the standstill, uh, I would say that uh, precisely the problem of defining a standstill is one of the greatest questions. Because, for instance, I don't know exactly, but for now, I may have lost my numbers, but uh, uh, what is a standstill? Is the, is the quantity of subsidies that the United States, I'm taking the United States, for example, because it's easier in my mind, is spent two years ago? which was about $9, $10 billion in, in distorting internal subsidies, or is it what they are allowed to do, which is more than $50 billion? So, so we start defining there. What is standstill? Is the tariff that Brazil and Mercosul applies now, or is the tariff that we are allowed to apply according to WTO? So that, that's the difficulty. But I think the two questions relate somehow, because, uh, of course, even if you if conclude the door around, it will not solve the problems that you referred. The problem is, is that, uh, you know, it's like, I don't know how it's called in English, I think it's bursitis. Is it bursitis, this, this pain that you have in the... In the, in the when you have a pain yeah, like that, you have to act against the pain, not right. in favor of the pain. So concluding the door around goes against the natural negative instinct of protectionism and economic nationalism. And that's why it would be so helpful. What about all these issues that, uh, as Jean Pisani Ferry pointed out, uh, you know, don't even really technically form within the ambit of the Doha round or our current rules, but are still nonetheless protectionists? Well, I, I think what you've first got to do is lock in the Doha round, which I think there is a window to do in the second half of the year, and then deal with this, because this is incredibly complicated. And I think it's going to lead, you know, you've made the uh, argument on one side of these things which are not in conflict, but, you know, really are, should be, perhaps. You know, but there's also the whole issue of what is legitimate in terms of stimulation of one's own national economy. This time, it's not an easy debate to resolve. And I, don't, and I think if we were to postpone progress on trade until we'd solved that, we'd be kicking it into the long grass. So I would think we need to go at two steps, if you like. On, on the financial point, a little similarly. I mean, a lot of work has happened since November on the financial regulatory issues and some new institutional announcements, some, some new things on, on, on the scope of regulation will be put there. But I think going back to the first question of the afternoon, you know, we need to act with a certain caution and care just because you're quite right, Mr. Kornblum, we don't know what it will look like in a couple of years from now. And so we, 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 we need a system which is responsive and, 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 and and, and meets the changes as they occur. Question from the back, the gentleman there. Sinan Ulgan, I run Edam, a think tank based in Istanbul. Uh, we heard from the president of the Commission, Barroso, yesterday about how much Europe, the EU, is doing in terms of fiscal stimulus. Now, uh, we also know the US position about that rhetoric. But I was wondering whether his statements were convincing for countries like Brazil and India before the G20 summit about whether the EU is pulling its weight in terms of overcoming this economic crisis. And secondly, uh, I also want to underline the symbolism that the Doha round, uh, the, the conclusion of the Doha round will have. There is a widespread, very widespread feeling among the developing countries that what happened was very unfair that uh, this wasn't the doing of the developing world, that this crisis uh, came, emerged from uh, a lack of regulation uh, in, the, uh, in the US and possibly in continental Europe, but at the end of the day, we're on the same boat. So having the Doha round would show the developing world that uh, the developed countries are, do actually care about the fate of the rest of the world. 
Okay, it's two, two questions there, both, both very interesting and pointed ones. Mr. Amarim, what do you well, reckon? First, I was not here when Mr. Barroso spoke, so I don't know exactly what he okay, said. Okay, well, if I can rephrase it for you then. There's, there's yeah. been this uh, <laughs> argument you, we've all seen reported between, uh, Britain yeah. and the Uni between I'm, Europe I'm and the United States about fiscal stimulus. So whose side are you on? <laughs> he, he said both once, so I'll say <laughs> neither okay. uh, this time. Uh, it, well, uh, we understand that the world needs stimulus, but of course the stimulus, if it is accompanied by protectionist measures, instead of being positive, it's negative. Uh, I think the stimulus also has to be proportionate to the degree of responsibility <laughs> that each country has in this crisis. You cannot uh, ask, for that matter, Turkey, Brazil, or India to have the same kind of responsibility than the United States or Europe for, has for that matter. Uh, we know that Europe has other problems related to Eastern Europe and maybe other questions that I, I can't address now, but I think Europe also should make an effort in terms of the stimulus package. In the question of the symbolism of the door around, if I understood well, you actually agreed with me, so uh, uh, maybe coming from a different uh, uh, position. I think the big, stimu the big stimulus, especially as uh, Bob Zelik and others said, we have to finish with what we have. You know, I think there were two things that made the door around not to be concluded in July, December. And they are very simple. Mm -hmm. One was the very, let us say, understandable caution of countries like India, not only India, a country, not only India, countries like India who had a big concern with their own domestic small farm agriculture. The other, I have to say that, was a little bit of greed on the part of U.S. manufacturers. So uh, uh, if, if now we come, if the, if the elections in India would allow to relieve a little bit that problem and the U.S. manufacturers understand there's a lot to gain by the simple fact of keep the, the system functioning, because after all they are the biggest, uh, I think we would conclude that rather quickly. But it has to be on the basis of what we have there. If we start to change a lot, then it's finished. Then we'll have to have yeah. four or five years. Mr. Chama, can, can I ask you what, what do you make of this argument about fiscal stimulus? Do you have a sympathy no, one way or not. another, or is it I irrelevant? Think, I think it's a very fair point that we've heard uh, a lot of talk about you know, stimulus packages for bailing out banks and insurance companies and, and the rest, but uh, we haven't heard too much about uh, uh, you know, stimulus packages for those countries that are the most exposed, the most vulnerable, the most affected, and not as the point was made for any cause of their own. And the only point I've heard is from Robert Zellick saying, all right, at least give a certain percentage mm. of your domestic fiscal plan and, and, see, and have a global conscience about what's happening. Mr. Zellick, do you think you're going to get any mileage out of that suggestion, that, that a little bit of the fiscal stimulus be earmarked for the developing world? I think there's an interest. I think Prime Minister Brown has picked up on it. And uh, we've already seen some of the developed countries uh, try to provide some additional support in areas that they can get through their own political system. In Germany, it's more infrastructure and microfinance. Japan, it was recapitalizing banks and trade finance. So I think this is, again, if I come back to the practical side of multilateralism, we, we need some agility here of connecting where donor countries with their own political constraints might be willing to do more and connect it with developing country needs. Um, but it, it, in, in some ways it goes back to your very first question. What's important to remember here is it is a global crisis that will require a global solution. And in terms of global stimulus, in some ways you could probably get more bang for the buck if you make the investments in some developing countries <clears throat> than you would in some developed countries. Now that's not so easy to do. It's not so easy to tell taxpayer in one country to do it in another country. But I do think this means in the development side, uh, we need to try to you know, find the interconnections, as in the infrastructure field, uh, where you can get multiple benefits. And that brings you right back to the trade argument. In a sense, what will really drag us down is the idea that each country can sort of build its wall, tighten it back down. The more you see that growth in one country will help in another country, the more you keep markets open, that's the only way you're going to get out of this mess. And so in that sense, you know, coming back to this, the whole concept of multilateralism, the G20 can't do it all, but it can try to give a boost to the WTO process. It can try to give additional resources to the IMF. It can try to give some support to some of the things we're doing in the World Bank. And so I tend to see this as a network model as opposed to a hierarchical model. And in that sense, the, the G20 can play a catalytic role 
But as, as everybody else has said here, those countries don't control it by themselves. Right. Yeah, the lady over there. Hi, I'm Penny Noss. I'm with the Bank City Group. Um, uh, first off, one point I was going to make about the SCC and Sarbanes-Oxley was uh, an issue that's been on the front pages today has been the issue of pay for U.S. bankers and some of the actions that were taken on Friday. And if there's anything that's going to boost London, potentially again, it's going to be uh, some of these actions driven by populist sentiment that we can all understand and some of us are also quite furious at some people in our firms. But, uh, <laughs> and uh, name but that's going to come around. More broadly, on the G20 question, though, I, I would actually compliment the G20. There's actually quite a bit of substance on the table there and quite a bit of very serious things that are being looked at and addressed. But there are some who I talk with who question the next steps of the G20 and what all this means because there's no legal treaty or legal obligations underpinning the G20 meetings. So the question I was going to ask was, in terms of the title of this um, session today, if we are going to move forward with the G20, does there need to be some kind of legal treaty or obligation underpinning it, or are the existing treaty obligations and legal um, organizations that we work through sufficient to carry forward the objectives of that meeting? Mark, do you well, well, look, I mean, on that point, it uh, builds on something I said earlier. Everything the G20 will agree needs to go somewhere else for legal endorsement, if you like. But that's the nature of the decisions. For example, trade finance, there'll be a good strong package on that, but it's going to be built around Bob's leadership at the bank. So we need to work through the board of the bank to support him. Uh, the regulatory issues will be dealt with at the national level. So I don't think, just as the G7, G8 never had a kind of legal treaty basis, the G20 doesn't need it. And in fact, it would be counterproductive because it would create a lot of resentment. Its informal clearinghouse catalytic role is the essence of its effectiveness, that it's setting up decisions for other institutions to take, as long as those decisions are taken quickly and promptly after the meeting. Just, just on your other point about bankers' salaries, I'm not sure bankers are going to do that much better in the UK at the moment either. And, and I think you know, it raises a very real issue, and it's exactly the kind of thing where you don't want to rush to solutions. This is a very odd moment where a lot of governments like my own that never expected to own banks find we do. Uh, and we just need to be very careful here. On the one hand, respond to an absolute fury across all our voters across the world at the idea of undeserving huge bonuses and wealth taken out at the same time that banks did things which are felt to have destroyed an economy we all grew on. And we need to kind of bear that in mind. Against it, we need to bear in mind that it is the financial sector whose innovation has, in a country like mine since 1986, created 30 years approximately, or 20 plus years, of an uh, astonishing prosperity uh, for, all, for the country as a whole. And we just need to let these two facts settle into some balance before we race to do some things which would, you know, permanently seek to globally regulate bank salaries. How do you feel about permanent um, global regulation of bank salaries? No, no, not that, but I think I don't think we should presume on any kind of formal, institutional, legalistic continuation of the G20, mm. because there are a lot of countervailing forces against that idea itself. In fact, the present meeting itself is called the London Summit, not the G20 Summit. Okay. Uh, on, that, on, that, on that point, maybe sure. just one point. I agree with uh, both here that uh, we do, should not try to legalize or give a legal basis to the, to the G20. I don't think it would, uh, it, G20 is a political body that will influence uh, decisions on other bodies. Having said that, I do think that it is important to reform the existing bodies to make them compatible with the new era. And that applies to the, to the World Bank, to the IMF, to the, to, 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 to the United Nations. Curiously enough, the WTO, because it's very, inform, very informal, it somehow reformed its decision-making process, which is basically a negotiating process, without having to go through under any reform. If you take four years ago, and you would, uh, four years, 10 years ago or 15 years ago, and you would say the Quad, the Quad would be the United States, uh, United, uh, Europe, uh, United, uh, European Union, Japan, and Canada. If you say the Quad today, it will be the United States, European Union, 
India and Brazil. So that was reform without really calling it so. Hmm. And there's another hidden point in Celso's point, which is the European Union is, in, is represented by one party. Absolutely. It works very well. <laughs> 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 you are the most convinced European here, here in the room. <laughs> um, the gentleman here and then here. Yes, uh, thank you. Jean Deray from uh, Belgium. Now, in this uh, reflection about uh, the world architecture, my question was about the IMF because uh, we did not speak very much about the IMF as such. Obviously, now everyone believes again in the IMF, but, uh, well, its structures are what, what they were. Uh, some say the Americans dominate too much. Some say the Europeans are too overrepresented, and in the third world they don't like it because of past uh, programs. But, um, but w w what else is there? Can we, is it possible, it's realistic to reform the IMF and make it the regulatory body at the world level which could uh, be accepted by everyone and what, what is needed to, uh, to make it, or, or, or is it not possible and then we have to do something okay. else to create something else? Um, and the gentleman here, you had a question. <laughs> Good, Vice Commission, Member of Parliament, Germany. Um, only a brief question. If we don't use this historical momentum in order to bring about the Doha round in this very momentum, if we don't deliver this, when it will going to happen? Well, back to uh, tra trade. We also, you, you could have an opportunity to reform your neighbours at the IMF. What, what, what would you like to see done to them? <laughs> um, well, the spirit in which I tried to approach all of this and this networked idea is to try to actually make sure that we work more closely in a cooperative fashion. But I think, going back to Celso Amarin's point, I think it's inevitable that the World Bank and the IMF uh, will adjust some of the voting rights on the board. We added another seat for Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, but each institution has to face its own complexities. And the, in this sense, for example, the World Bank is an issue a little different from the IMF, but it shows you where this becomes not quite so easy. Um, one of our big um, tools is IDA, which are grants and uh, very concessionary no-interest loans for the 80 poorest countries. Uh, most of that money comes from developed countries, although Brazil is a good contributor, uh, but the, the challenge, and China did for the first time. So when you think about uh, board seats, it's not only is it the relative weight of the economy, but you also have to figure out, you know, who's going to be contributing to these funds. We have eight European chairs out of 24. So compared to the, the, the WTO, it looks a little heavy on European representation. On the other hand, the reality is some of those countries have roles because they are bigger contributors, and it would probably be hard for them to get support from their parliaments to make those contributions if they didn't have chairs. I'm not presuming the solution, but I'm just saying that there are more complex trade-offs. There are things that the management can do, and for example, I've appointed 11 officers and nine of them are from the developing world. So there's things you can do with the staffing to try to help, but ultimately it becomes a difficult decision among shareholders of, of trade-offs. But I think it, it will happen, just as, as Celso said in the WTO uh, that it started to happen. And then part of the question is, um, you know, coming back to some of the interactions of this, is that um, how these informal systems will get this balance between more representation and effectiveness. And I suspect that what you'll see is a, a larger group, but then some informal subgroups uh, within them. And that stage is still uh, to be developed. Could There's one point, yeah. though, which uh, from even the, the, let us say, moral or ethical point of view has to be reformed, is the fact, and I don't know if Bob Zelik will like the, what I'm commenting, although we agree on most things here, but where, why did God write uh, down that the, 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 the director general, the chairman of the World Bank has to be an American and the chairman of the, of the IMF has to be an European. Uh, I, don't, I, I, I don't think it's in the Bible, in the Koran, or in any other... Is, is it in the Bible? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but uh, presumably you can be quite relaxed no, on this bo point. Both, so. of, both have actually said, Celso, that you know, they need to have an open, merit, trans uh, transparent process. I will say, and you know from international institutions, uh, I haven't seen too many Americans ever get the WTO Director Generalship, the UN Secretary General. So the reality is, if, if one's going to reform the multilateral system, and we want fairness and equity, fairness and equity all across the board. I'm totally in favor of that. <laughs> <laughs>
during right. Security Council reform, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> now, okay, um, that will be a debate I, for China more than it is, is for the U.S. The, <laughs> I, I, don't, I think these financial institutions are absolutely pivotal institutions. Mm. I don't think it helps the world to see their emasculation. I think we need to see them stronger, but we need to see them retooled and attuned to a global delivery horizon. They have to be agencies expressing the multilateralism of the world and expressing the mechanics of the new multilateralism as well. And uh, so I think uh, I have nothing against the talk of nationality of the DG or the voting rights. We must be very careful on one point. All hands on the steering wheel must be exerting their energy to move the ship away from the looming iceberg and not just rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic. That's the issue here. When I hear this kind of talk, I say, fine, but this is in-house talk. Mm. I don't think the world outside is that interested. The world outside is, how are you morphing and transforming yourself into answerable institutions to what's happening to the world itself, not what's happening to you? As for your question, I'm very sympathetic with it. When you said, if you can't do it now, because there's nothing to be said for disaster, except this, it really helps in concentrating the mind. Yeah. So I agree with you, let us not squander this catastrophe. Yeah. I, mean, I, I think, look, as I've gone to developing countries, they're very clear on the IMF, the World Bank is, is in a privilegedly different position on this. But on the IMF, there are three interrelated things. You know, yes, it's got to have the resources to help us, but it's got to have a completely changed business model so its money actually does help us. Uh, in fact, you know, an, an African president used the phrase to us, it's not additionality of resources, it's availability, by which they mean money on terms they can actually afford and access, and on payback which, arrangements which will allow them to use it. And for that, that goes immediately into the issue of governance and staffing because they believe it is the fact that these institutions, or the IMF in this case, is not viewed as accountable to them, which has led to its business model being so far from their interests. Yes, of course, on the trade issue, second half of this year, I think there is a real window to get it done. An issue which has not been raised here, of course, is climate change. I was where about to, yeah. You know, well, perhaps I should let you yeah, just no, raise I mean, it. Yeah, it, no, it, it did uh, strike me that, I mean, for obvious reasons, we focused on the G20 because it's a couple of weeks away, but mm. uh, there's this other huge international negotiation which is meant to climax in December in, in Copenhagen. And uh, there are many people, and perhaps myself included, who think that the chances, already quite dim, of concluding a, a decent agreement in Copenhagen must, must have been made worse by the global economic crisis. It must become harder. So... How do, you, how do you think that the climate change negotiations will proceed now in this new economic climate? Perhaps, Mr. Zelik, I can start with you. Well, I think there's a strong political momentum for it. I, I worry that um, uh, a lot of these pieces interconnect with other items that we've discussed, and I'm concerned that they're not been fully drawn out. So, for example, one we talked about a little bit in advance is that I don't think you're going to have a successful climate change agreement unless you have some financing arrangements. And yet, when I talk with finance ministers, understandably perhaps, this really isn't on their screen. So one of the things we've been trying to do at the World Bank is to come up with some climate investment funds and have different mechanisms. But this is a very sensitive issue about relative authority with the, the UN bodies and others. And it invokes some of these same questions about, you know, institutions and how they interrelate. Um, a second issue that connects to trade is one I mentioned this morning is you know, there's some ideas that if developed countries are going to make commitments to cap their carbon emissions, that they will impose carbon taxes on imports from countries that do not have the same emissions levels. Well, that would violate the WTO agreements and would certainly kill the prospect for developing countries working with developed countries to reach a climate change deal. And there's no effective deal unless you have developing and developed countries together on this. They may have different obligations, but they have to be together. So it's, it's another example that the, sometimes policymakers of the world see these in individual boxes. The reality is they, they interconnect. And when they work best, groups like the G20 or others 
can help cut across some of those categories. Not that they can make all the decisions themselves, but they can identify the issues and then try to say, well, the World Bank needs to work with the UNFCCC on the financing arrangements or others to sort of steer a, a, a network process. Mr. Amarim, um, how do you feel about the climate change well, negotiations? I, I would agree with that assessment. I'm not so pessimistic, of course. Uh, uh, one thing that happened, in those who were in Geneva in July will say, well, if you cannot agree in a trade agreement because of mysterious things which is called SS SSM, when nobody could uh, uh, define precisely how can we agree on a, such a complex thing like climate change. But uh, I, in this respect, I, I think that, uh, in a way, the change of mood in the American administration is a positive thing. Uh, and that, uh, of course, I'm not sure if we'll be able to do because the time from here to Copenhagen is quite short. But I, I, I think Bali w had some new ideas that appear there. Developing countries for the first time decided that they could take some, what they called, they didn't want to w go use the word target because target is linked to a specific aspect of the climate change convention, convention but they say that they would prepare to accept quantifiable objectives, which for all practical purposes is a target. So uh, these, these things are evolving in a way, and at least big developing countries like Brazil, China, China and India. Uh, but uh, I would agree. I mean, many of the aspects depend on finance, especially if you take very small African countries or very small countries in the Pacific. How can they take obligations if they don't have the financial means to deal with them? Yeah, Mr. Um, but if you're talking about how to make multilateralism work, mm. When you have to talk about governance, if you relate the contingency, which is the climate, climate calamity which is upon us, with the absence of any international IUG, international environmental governance mechanism or progress, you wonder how is it that we feel that the most exposed, like Pacific Island states, where they adapt, who need their needs of adaptation, the needs of mitigation, who really is in charge of the shop? Because when you go to the Pacific, even these uh, institutes who are examining what is happening, they see no political will whatsoever. On the governance side, uh, I'm reminded of a sentence I read in James Martin's book, The Meaning of the 21st Century. And he says the assiduity and the concentration with which we are degrading and ruining our habitat, to me, can now possibly be explained by only one thought, that perhaps as a species, Humankind is losing its instinct for self-preservation. Otherwise, I cannot explain it. Well, uh, do, do you have a collective death wish, Mark? No. no <laughs> but, I mean, I, I, you know, look, I think it's a really important deal to get done, <coughs> but it's very easy to see how we might end the year having you know, made some significant step forward in economic governance, but having failed, on, if you like, on environmental governance just because of the nature of the economic crisis we're in. But, you know, frankly... This issue of imbalances that I determined in terms of global consumption is as much an issue of how we bear down on our limited global environmental resources. So we have to deal with it. And I think there's a row developing because, you, you know, Celso's, uh, you know, is relatively confident. But I have to say that this issue of the financing is going to be key. In developing countries, there's a growing view that money shouldn't be a constraint because of the sheer amounts of money we've been willing to throw at our financial system. Surely the amounts of money for mitigation can't really be that much. They're a fraction compared to what we've thrown at Citibank, for example, goes, uh, goes the argument. On our side, the argument is this recovery has been so, it is going to be so expensive, is in creating such deficits for us that we have to cut public spending, which isn't directly related to it. And that's, I think, intellectually where probably most people from developed economies would be in this room. And obviously there's a risk that climate change is a victim of that difference of a view about the availability of resources. At least in a recession you should emit less CO2, I suppose, no? <laughs> That's a yeah. silver lining. <laughs> where, where, there's a, where there's a very short-term interconnection is that some of the decisions that countries will be making on infrastructure and technology today will have long-term effects. Mm -hmm. And so that's one reason why, again, when you have a sense of how the rubber hits the road on this, one of the things we've been trying to do at the bank is to start some of these funds to show, for example, 
uh, how technological change in Mexico with transportation system, it doesn't have to be rocket science technology, or this is big use in China or elsewhere, can make a big difference. Um, the forestation, deforestation issue, I mean, 80% of the emissions or 20% of the emissions are from the deforestation issue. So where, where the pieces do need to fit together is that the exact time people are making some investments, um, you would presumably want them designed in a more low-carbon way. And I think we can get that into the summit communicate. That, that Hang on, we've got, we've got about uh, 10 minutes left. Uh, and let uh, me I would like to make one yeah. comment, because, but not on, on this particular issue. But I would say that we are talking about several different issues, which are all important, like trade, finance, climate change. Mm. Uh, all of them, in a way, uh, we could add poverty, and we, all of them, in a way, relate to security. And I don't see how we can solve uh, these questions, the institutional questions, without looking at them together. And, you know, if for something disaster is good, it would be precisely to redefine the institutions. That should not mean that we should stop and wait until we re redefine the institutions to do the things that we need to do now, but this is a crucial moment if we want to improve the world governance. Okay, I will perhaps rashly just take two more questions in the last ten minutes. There, both, was, both a, there was a Brazilian request for the UN Security Council, if you didn't quite... <laughs> Appropriate. Uh, Markus Eder from uh, Policy Planning in the German Foreign Ministry. I wanted to pick up on the question of how we bring these issues together. I mean, wouldn't the default uh, solution be to call for a global green recovery in London? I mean, wouldn't, uh, wouldn't it also help Copenhagen? And wouldn't we start a narrative uh, for a future low-carbon economy? I mean, uh, capital is also looking for a new narrative. And uh, before the crisis, we thought that uh, low-carbon investment was uh, okay. investment in the future uh, sustainable economy. Good. Okay, now t two more brief questions, and then we'll wrap it up. Uh, the gentleman here. Um Pierre Lévy from the French policy planning staff. Uh, my, my question is still on the question of, uh, of, um, uh, of climate change and climate change and security. Uh, it's, a, it's a very trendy uh, uh, subject. Uh, it is appealing to people because it frights them. We, they have sometimes images of floods, uh, immigrants, and, uh, and conflicts. It raises a real issue in terms of governance uh, among different institutions, and the UK organized, I think, two years ago for the first time, a debate at the Security Council, which was very, uh, very interesting. So I wanted to, to, to ask you, uh, especially Lord Malogban, how much do you, do you think this, uh, this issue is, uh, is appealing is in terms of marketing to, to, to mobilize concerning uh, uh, climate change and, and how much do, can we, how can we cope with it? Okay, and last question just here. Uh, you know, there are two people. Sorry, that, can you say who you are? Oh, I'm sorry, thank you. <laughs> uh, Congressman Darrell Eiser from California. Uh, Rahm Emanuel, the chief of staff to the new president, is often quoted for his statement that uh, never let a good uh, uh, crisis go to waste. Uh, Einstein is less often quoted for uh, in the middle of adversity lies opportunity. With the crisis of the day clearly being the meltdown of traded and guaranteed assets around the world, it's interesting that I'm – in this whole discussion, I don't, the whole weekend, I haven't heard anyone say, okay, how do we get the kind of transparency on these and other assets on a global basis so that we can not ha call them toxic when, in fact, only some portions of them are toxic? So from a multilateral standpoint, a common, whether it's XBRL or some other maybe less well-known uh, data. Why is it we're not talking in terms of the G20 meeting and saying we can never again allow assets to be traded globally if, in fact, they cannot be looked at online <laughs> in real time so that people can make sensible decisions on what their value is long before it becomes a crisis? So I guess going more toward Einstein, isn't that actually the opportunity that comes from the adversity, not all the other things that can be piggybacked onto the fundamental crisis? Okay, well, I'm going to ask you all to do a rather difficult thing, which is to answer all those three questions and somehow summarize the discussion in an elegant fashion in the last uh, six or seven minutes. Um, who wants to go first? Uh, Mr. Sharma, perhaps. Well, to answer that question, when I set out the principles uh, which have been subscribed to by all the leaders of the Commonwealth, I did mention specifically accountability and transparency. 
everybody knew the importance of that, no matter what line of activity uh, uh, you're in. I think that uh, uh, when we talk of multilateralism and its place, we must always, also always bear in mind that it is not limited to interstate multilateralism. In fact, interstate multilateralism today must serve healthy multilateralism wherever and by whichever route it takes place. We all know the argument that non-state actors are a very important element of our global life and we must recognize that whether it is NGOs or corporations or the civil society, youth bodies, women bodies, they really are a huge charge globally today in transforming the world. And I think these institutions, which is why I said, you know, we need to empower these institutions which we already have and not talk them down. We must talk them up and keep on talking them up because the ambition horizon for them should be to work for states and to work for the world uh, in the way in which I have mentioned. I make one last point. Take the youth as a, re as a global resource. I think 75% of the world is youth, now, you know, under 25, age 25. The future of what happens to the youth of the world is going to determine what's happened to human societies. I'm not sure what the World Bank or what the IMF, what kind of plan they have. They, of course, they have some plans. In a total way, the UN working in this, private sector working in this, having a deliverable plan for the youth of the world. Now, when you talk about multilateralism, you must have the object in view and also must coordinate and become coherent. The debate has to move away from interstate multilateralism talk. Thank you. Well, that's, that is an ambitious long-term objective. Um, <laughs> Mark Malik Brown, we heard a couple of questions sort of circling around this issue you've already discussed, which is how do we tie together the climate change crisis and the economic crisis so that they don't actually contradict each other and that somehow we get them to dovetail. Yes. Is there a way of doing it? I, I think so, but I mean, I, I think it is worth just observing the difficulty we as the hosts of the London Summit have had in putting low carbon recovery as much at the centre of this as we would have liked to have done. Part of it is because we Brits are seen as serial international initiative launchers, so there's a deep suspicion of us when it comes to this. I think but that's the one, second, of, one of the kind of things they said about <laughs> us. Yeah, but the, but, the, but, the, um, but the second more substantive point is a worry that it's a hidden trade measure and third uh, that you know somehow we're, we're, we're stumbling into Copenhagen territory and you need the expertise for that so we believe we can get the greening the recovery the Bob Zellick point about making sure nothing we do in the infrastructure and energy investment level sets back our objectives and we can give a good plug for Copenhagen but we are a bit limited but I think when we want this conversation to go beyond a room like this to where it's got to go to, which is restoring confidence to the six billion voters and consumers and citizens in our world that we know where we're going and there's a way forward, a path forward for us as global citizens. This issue of bringing the economics and sustainability and environment together is key, as is, final point, the need of making sure that we have something as strong in this, a life raft for the world's poor as well, who so easily every conversation we have about this become the afterthought but are more even perhaps than in climate change yet again the kind of re pretty much the innocent victims of this uh, who have really gotten knocked off down by it and we need to if it's to kind of carry global confidence it's environment plus poverty that we need to address. Mr. Amarim we've got only about two or three minutes left and it's been a very rich discussion so it's perhaps impossible to ask you to summarize it, but if I could perhaps ask you, coming out of the G20, if you had to write the newspaper headlines, what would be the, the two things you'd like to see that, that emerged from that meeting? Well, fortunately, I'm not a journalist, because <laughs> otherwise I'll see still another flop, because yeah. that's what the journalists always write. Yeah. But, uh, 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 but I, I, I think that one thing that I would like to say and to stress uh, is the urgency of all these measures and the urgency of these reforms. Uh, we cannot be talking about them forever, as others said. And, you know, I, I just want to touch on a social and psychological aspect that nobody touched. People spoke here about the different uh, problems, the different banks and different institutions, 
institutions had, but for the common people, when they see these trillions and trillions of dollars being wasted and they don't have money to invest on some basic things, I mean, and I praise Bob Zelik for his initiative, and when you say, see, for instance, I believe it was the chairman of AIG saying that they would give back, uh, I believe, half of their bonus, that sounds to me a little bit like Marie Antoinette's before the, uh, the, the French Revolution, but we are in a global era, so it may be much, much worse. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Zellig, you, you made the point right at the beginning that perhaps it's a mistake just to focus on the G20, so perhaps I'll give you a slightly longer time horizon. If you had to look at this whole year, what would you most like to see come out of a very important year for multilateral economic governance? Well, first, to, to address Daryl's point, I think it's a very good point. I think that the challenge there would be, of course, um, with um, proprietary trading systems, whether people also have confidential information in their systems. But that's a good idea. Um, well... I'll, I'll come back to the point I've been trying to stress, which is um, we've got a serious problem out there. <laughs> and, and part of legitimacy is solving problems and effectiveness. And, uh, and I think while you know, the purpose of this discussion is to talk about how you can adjust multilateralism and governance, let's not lose sight of the key ball, which is, you know, how do we get these economies re-stimulated, how do we fix up the banking systems, how do we prevent protectionism? And the reason why this shouldn't be underestimated is, for all our talk, what we have to recognize, and you've got some elected representatives here, they're still responsible, by and large, to national authorities. And those national authorities are concerned about what takes place at home. And so the reason why these trade agreements are so difficult is not because people don't understand the trade aspects. It's because each of them has to come up with a political explanation at home. So what I would suggest is, is as you think about multilateral structures, don't lose sight of the world as it is with the real problems you have, how you have to explain things at home. And the art, in a sense, is using these institutions and regimes sort of to come with cooperative solutions that everybody can explain at home. Okay, thank you very much. It's a uh appropriately kind of uh, global and political thought on which to end. So I'd just like to thank the whole panel. Thank you very much. Uh, invaluable help in setting up many of the economics uh, sessions at this year's Brussels Forum. And now it's time for a taste of Latvia. Our good uh, friends uh, in Latvia have supplied uh, various tasty things for uh, the break. And when we come back, we'll talk about uh, 20 years after the fall of the wall. So thank you.